Well, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to the first in our nine-part interview series in preparation for the celebration of the centennial of the Hymn Society in the United States and Canada. I am really looking forward to all these conversations. We're going to be interviewing various leaders of the Hymn Society over the past 30-some years, and uh, all in preparation for next summer's celebration of the 100th anniversary of the Hymn Society. Today, I am really excited to, to be welcoming Sui Hong Lim, who is uh, a former member of the Executive Committee of the Hymn Society and actually served as Director of Research from 2014 until 2020. Uh, currently, he is the Associate Professor of Sacred Music and Director of the Master of Sacred Music Program at Emmanuel College at the University of Toronto. Uh, he and Lester Ruth just recently published uh, a new book called Loving on Jesus, uh, which is a history of uh, Christian praise and worship music. And we'll, we'll be talking about that, that hopefully a little later as well. Um, he's the music director for next summer's General Assembly of the World Council of Churches, which may or may not actually take place. We were talking about that a little bit before, before we got started. But one of the things that occurred to me as I was reading about his many accomplishments is he, he's one of those people that's a, a triple threat. He is a practitioner who has a lot of experience in actually leading people in congregational song. Uh, he's also a creator of congregational song, a composer in many different genres. And he's also a scholar. Uh, he, in addition to his most recent book, he's done a number of other scholarly works and is, of course, uh, working as a professor. So um, he's got a lot to offer to us in, in uh, this conversation today about the state of congregational song, where we've come with congregational song, and how the hymn society has uh, played, or played a role in all that. Anyway, on to our conversation. Welcome, Sui Hong. It's great to be with you today. Thank you, Mike, for this invitation. I'm very grateful. I think um, one of the things for me, I mean, I've known you as a member of the executive committee, but I've had a chance to kind of uh, read a little bit about, about your background. And I was very struck to read that, um, that this all started in your family. Uh, you uh, were born and raised in Singapore. And uh, I read that you're, in your family, there was a lot of influence on your decision to pursue church ministry and, and uh, music as a vocation. Can you say a little bit more about that? Yeah, um, you're right. I, I grew up in a Christian home in Singapore. Um, and my mother really enjoyed music making. Um, and then her music making passion uh, was placed on her children. So there are four of us as uh, brothers and sisters. And so she was determined that we would learn music. So basically, on the four of us, three of us really dabbled into music making. Well, actually, four of us dabbled into music making uh, on the piano. But my older brother decided to create a radio transceiver. So he made music through electronic means. So I thought that was very interesting for us to move in that direction. Uh, from an early age, we would be in church most of the time. Uh, and we are always exposed to choral singing or, or even worship services. And by the time I was 12, I was actually serving as a uh, choir accompanist and a service uh, musician as well. So, yeah, that's my background. And your background is pretty ecumenical too, huh? Uh, yeah. Different denominations involved? Yeah, my, my mom was a, a Bible Presbyterian, which is a much more conservative group of Presbyterian people. My dad was Baptist. Um, and then I went to a Methodist school and I got involved with the Methodist school. But in my I, high school years, I dabbled in Anglicanism, um, the Pentecostal charismatic movement. So yeah, I was all over the place kind of thing. Um, but hard to say what I finally landed in my younger days. But now I'm mostly uh, Methodist. It's you're kind of the World Council of Churches. Uh, it, we're just all, all yourself, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, in a way, because I, I think having this uh, diverse background helps me to be able to communicate with people from different denominations. Um, in fact, earlier on, I was serving within the World Methodist Conference, uh, which is a much more conservative group uh, compared to other forms of Methodism uh, in other parts of the world. So I think it's, it's the ability to have the necessary vocabulary so that when we are, where I am now in the World Council of Churches, I understand where the concerns are coming from, what 
what are the, the thoughts behind the questions or the comments that they are making. Um, so it makes uh, much easier, I mean, it's easier for me to then have communication and try to resolve some of the tensions when it comes to music selection and worship planning. Great. Just going back to your background for a moment, um, were there other early influences? I mean, like if you were to say, let's say one person besides your someone other than in your family that sort of led you to where you are today, could, could you name somebody? Yeah, I name a couple of people for you. Uh, most of them are uh, continue to be very very important to me. Uh, first and foremost would be Ito Lo, uh, because he was the one who recruited me to move from Singapore. Uh, and gave me the opportunity to study with him in Manila. Um, the other person that is equally important would be Michael Horn, who gave me the first opportunity to teach my peers about Asian church music. Um, the third person would be S.D. Kimbra, which is also a fellow of the Hymn Society as well. Um, he gave me the opportunity to have my first hymn published. Wow. Um, so those are, uh, well, uh, not forgetting uh, Karen Tucker, let's put it this way. Uh, she gave me the opportunity to, be, to publish an academic essay. So these are the people that really mattered uh, uh, and nurtured uh, me to where I am right now today. Yeah. Uh, now you, you, you moved from, from Asia to North America. That had right. to have been a pretty, pretty significant uh, shift in perspective. And uh, I, I was wondering, um, you know, as you came to North America, what did you notice that uh, surprised you or uh, really struck you uh, as compared with your previous experience in Asia? I, I think the first thing that struck me when I moved over to North America, well, and let me put it this way, there, are, there were several trips back and forth between Asia and North America. Um, because after my studies in the Philippines, I worked in, in Singapore, and then I went over to Perkins in Dallas, and then I went back to Singapore to serve, and then I was back out again to New Jersey to do my doctoral work, then back home again to serve, and then up to uh, Texas again to work at Baylor, and then up to Toronto. So it's been back and forth. Mm. What I noticed uh, that I felt interesting was that there were many types of Christianity in North America. There is the type, different types as in terms of the theological positions that the denominations had. Uh, different in terms of that they were grappling with social issues as well. Uh, whereas if you find Christianity outside of North America, we tend to be much more, what I would say, extraterrestrial focused, heavenly places. We are less dealing with what is actually on the ground. Yes, there are injustices. Yes, there are poverty. Those are there. We live with them. But there's no really a kind of a social activist action to challenge that kind of thing or challenge the government. Um, at least that's my understanding from, the, from my, pers my background as a Singaporean. I mean, certain Christianities in Philippines tend to have that activist uh, focus um, and also in Indonesia, but certain countries like Singapore, no, we are, very, we are quite passive in that sense. Um, Christianity, it seems as a way of being engaged with God um, and, and trying to live up the, the commandments of care for our society. But there's no, there's no thinking of, well, we're going to hold the government accountable for this kind of action. I think that's quite uh, common here uh, that I'm seeing in, um, in the US, um, that somehow North America has, um, has this voice the church has this voice to speak out against such concerns kind of thing. And to me, that's interesting. That's uh, a really, really interesting point. I, 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 having you said a lot of long time association with Catholic church myself, yeah. I think of the Philippines and yeah. uh, some of the friction that's gone on between the government and the church uh, there. Um, yeah. I was thinking of Cardinal Sin, you know, coming out against oh, yeah. uh, Marcos and yeah. uh, the, the kind of involvement in the social movements there. Um, but you're saying that that's not really not, not common throughout Asia. No, because a lot of Christianities in Asia are minorities. We, we, we don't have the clout of right. saying we are equal to the, to, to the government. We, we don't see that. In the Philippines, because it is a so-called Christian country, you'll see that. 
Whereas in Christianity, in Indonesia, India, Singapore, Malaysia, it is a minority. That's a really interesting perspective. I mean, in North America, we are so accustomed to being in the majority, right? right. Uh, having a huge voice that it's right. hard for us to imagine being um, a minority population in mm -hmm. any country, right? So it, it does certainly change the way we relate to the society. Yeah, yeah like for example, I'll give you an example. Um, I'm, I'm look on the dissertation committee for my Japanese international student. Christianity in Japan is only 1%. What kind of voice do you have to say, this is not the way to do it to the government? It's, it's practically impossible. So, yeah, yeah. So, so for me, um, having that perspective of saying, whoa, the, the Christians in North America have a say, that to me is remarkable. So do you, do you see those, that theological perspective spilling over into how and what people sing? Yeah. Um, I think the spillover comes for us, at least uh, if I'm to comment on the, on the global South, that means outside of North America, what, what do Christians sing? Um, there's always, well, I would say always, there are some expectation from North America and for, or from Europe to say, well, you are in this particular country. Why don't you sing songs from your own background? But the reality is because Christianity is a minority, we treasure what the, me the message that the missionaries have given to us. There's this need to preserve what we have received. So in that sense, uh, translated Western hymnody or congregational song becomes important to us. These songs become our songs. So a lot of times uh, when I speak to people who have been to Asia or Africa, say, oh, they were singing How Great Thou Art, but uh, uh, why are they doing that? Why are they not singing their own song? What we need to realize as visitors is that How Great Thou Art is now their song. It, it, it may be translated in our eyes who are coming from um, uh, North America, but these songs have now taken a new meaning. They have been subverted and become local songs to the local people. So we should not be surprised. In fact, I think it is a compliment to what the missionaries have done what we need to do as a church in North America is to encourage the local church to, to grow, to find and create their own songs. Mm -hmm. And do you see that going on quite a bit? Oh, yeah. I, I think in the last 10 years, a decade, that, is, that has changed. And I'll give you two examples where that is happening. Um, I'm in close contact with my friends in Singapore. Um, and Singapore uh, Methodism, has been around for 135 years, and we've never had our own hymnal. But as of two years ago, um, the Methodist School of Music is beginning to start curating new songs from Singapore. And that is unheard of um, that they are doing this uh, because we are what I would call a very westernized church in Singapore. Um, so this move is exciting. The other more groundbreaking thing is there's this accrediting theological agency called ATC or Association for Theological Education in Southeast Asia. It is akin to our ATS here in North America. This organization accredits degree programs. Now, last year, this accrediting organization decided to have a new initiative of curating local liturgical songs. Now, I mean, can you imagine a uh, accrediting body is not saying, okay, let's have the seminaries write their song and let's have something and, and, and create our own musical experience. We never hear that in ATS, but in Asia right now, that's happening. And hopefully by the end of this year or early next year, we will have a production a lit of liturgical music from Asia, from this that's accrediting body. That is pretty astonishing. I mean, I think that, you know, those of us who are into church music have always felt that, that church music is one of the primary ways of theological expression, right? Mm -hmm. But it doesn't seem to, to be a, a, a position widely held in the theological community. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, people are constantly complaining that there are not enough courses or enough attention in academic institutions to music. But it sounds like that they've sort of grabbed this essential insight that, that musical is one of the primary expressions of, of how to be church together, huh? 
Yeah, and, and this ATC year group is actually training or encouraging seminaries to find people or faculty members who can teach worship and music and offering them an Asian-wide training program. I mean, wow. where have we ever seen this? I, I'm not, I mean, it's in my lab, this is, this is so exciting because an accrediting body actually doing this? It's exciting. You know, that's, that is related to another question I was going to ask you about, you know, what in North America we can learn from the experience of Asian Christians singing um, I mean, this is this is one this is one you're one you're talking about right now. Sounds like something we could certainly benefit from. But I'm wondering what what's going on in Asia that that um, that North Americans can learn. I I think uh, in in Asia, or I will speak of Asia where Christianity is a minority. Mm -hmm. I think the key thing is where they understand uh, God can break through in their society in their music making. Um, also in the process of music making, the music itself is seen as an identity formation agency. It is not just, well, we sing because we enjoy singing, but we sing because this is the stance that we take. Um, this is what it means for us to be a Christian. And that's why for us, Amazing Grace, even though it is a, a British hymn, matters to our people because it sets us apart from the rest of the society that is not Christian. So I'm not sure whether that is coming into North America as well. For example, what, what songs define us as Christian in North America? Um, that was something I'll tell you a little uh, story. When I was interviewing for a job at Emmanuel in 2012, uh, when I came up to the, the interview uh, uh, section, I asked the people who were gathered, I said, um, Lutherans have a hymn that strongly they identify with. Um, what hymns do you as United Church identify with? And there was a pause because this idea that music can form your identity and shape your identity or enforce your identity is not very clear. I think we need to come back to this. What hymn or what congregational song that we can identify with that defines who we are as God's people. This is something that if you were to go to Asia, it becomes very clear. Any Western hymn that's translated in their tongue will become something that they can identify with. It makes them Christian. So in some ways, the, 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 more, one is, the more a community is a minority, the easier it is for them to latch onto something uh, that is going to clearly identify them in contrast to the rest of the, their society, yes? Right, yeah, because in ritual theory, there's an insider and outsider. And, and that's why when we are, for me, I'm very interested in post-colonial uh, expression. It is very hard for Western researchers to say, well, now sing something from your own background. We cannot do that because the things that are from their background does not define who they are as Christians. So there needs a work of contextualization. There needs a work for hybridization of new creating, new creating efforts. We cannot just say, well, we'll take this folk song and it'll make us as Asian Christians. You cannot do that. It doesn't work. So there's a need for a rethink. How do you help a church that is marginalized in the society to find its own voice? It has to be a blend of their missional heritage plus what they are willing to create for themselves. So this is a new paradigm that we are working on right now. That sounds fascinating because it sounds like, you know, not only does the music have to uh, I create an identity um, with respect to the society they're in, but also in, in, in the post-colonial sense, in, in contrast to the missionaries who brought, brought the faith uh, there in the first place, yes? Yeah, that's right. That's right. It, it, it's a different step. It's, and, and it is important to remember, particularly in Asia, harmony or harmonious living is very important. Um, the whole philosophical concept of both and is very important. We want to live in harmony. Um, we are less of an either or, kind of a binary opposition approach. Uh, we tend to avoid that. Um, so you find that when, as much as possible, when Krishna takes on a both-and approach, it tends to be better served 
uh, within the society rather than either or. Well, it sounds like a, you know, in North America, we can learn a lot from that experience because certainly the churches here are still struggling with um, the relationship of the church to society. You know, uh, does, does, you know, in the United States right now, there's a lot of uh, talk about religious freedom and uh, what, what does that really mean in, in the context of, of the society? So, uh, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's certainly a, a topic that we are going to look at. Um, I, I was you, you had mentioned um, Methodism, and I, I understand you did a lot of work on Wesleyan uh, texts. Is that isn't that right? Oh, yeah, yeah, right, Mike. Um, I I I Methodist, true and true, because I finally landed on it. Um, and what I did, and that I decided to say, why are there six thousand over texts of Charles Wesley, and in our hymnals there are only five. I had this particular question, why, why, are, why is he so underrepresented? Uh, especially as a Methodist, right? I mean, to me, that's so important. So I decided to try to, okay, let's give it a hand and see what can I do with this particular text. Mm -hmm. And so my first experiment was in the mid 1980s, before we even talking about retexting or retuning movement. Um, and out of, a, I found this particular book that S.C. Camber edited. Um, of Charles Wesley's text. I said, okay, let's choose a small poem and just write and see what happens from there. And so I wrote this particular, I chose this particular text, uh, Spiel for Thy Loving Kindness. Um, so that was the first hymn that I, I, hymn text that I retuned the thing. And I gave it a particular Chinese flavor to it. And then I sent it to ST. And as you say, Sui Hong, this is very nice. Well, how do you do this? And so he took it out and then he got it into the global praise imprint that he was editing. And, and I, I started writing more because I felt like you know, some of them are very nice uh, texts, but we need to sing more of them. And so from there on, um, I wrote uh, Charles Wesley, made him sound Indian, made him sound Chinese, made him sound Filipino, um, different kind of things, uh, different kind of musical character uh, through my training at EILM in Manila. Um, and then back in 1999, I wrote, uh, I found this text, E Servants of God. I'm not sure whether you heard about this one. Um, and I want, and this one came about because uh, my father-in-law suddenly passed away. And he was in his own way an evangelist. Um, and he had, in his circle of friends, he had uh, ex-con as well as ministers of the government. And then at his, uh, at his funeral, all these people came together. And it struck me, wow, he has, his, his, the people that, that were touched by his influence was amazing. And so I found this particular text, the servant of God, and I wrote it. And I said, well, let's make it a, a kind of proclamation praise. And that, at that time, I was very into contemporary praise and worship. And so it came out to a kind of a Charles Wesley in praise and worship style in that particular approach. Mm -hmm. um, and that caught on with some people and some of the young people discovered Wesley because of this particular tune that was praise and worship style. So, so I started dabbling in this and it is one of the things that I like to do. If I'm stressed, uh, I need a break or, and as a hobby, I will look for some Charles Wesley text and retune it. That's so cool. So <laughs> I, 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 you mentioned praise and worship and, and you and Lester Ruth have just come out with this book on uh, uh, history of uh, praise and worship music. Uh, how, did you, how, how did that come about? Okay, that came about because we were having coffee at Kelvin Worship Symposium about five years, three to five years ago. Um, and then we were approached by the acquisition editor uh, of Abington Press to say, why do you, uh, they wanted a new book to succeed uh, Jim White's uh, Introduction to Christian Worship. Uh, both Ruth uh, Lester and I are students of James White. Um, so when we were approached with this topic, we said, no, 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 we, we, we have too much respect for Jim White to actually write another book. <laughs> so we said, look, we all grew up with this contemporary worship practice. I used to play in a band, you know, and, and Lester was already uh, into praise and worship as well. So we said, why don't we write a history of praise and worship? Uh, for the classroom, we can say that. And so we said, we will develop this parallel to Jim White's Introduction to Christian Worship. So we position our book as an extension 
to Jim Hoyt's introduction to Christian worship, where he ended in 1980. We picked up the slack from there and we continue on. If you look at the way that we align the chapters, it's actually identical to his book, except for the on the section on music, where he had one chapter and, I, and we had two because, you know, praise and worship largely is centered around music making as well. Mm -hmm. And so this was the first project that we co-authored together, this particular book. Uh, when that was done, it was well received. And then Baker, uh, uh, we approached Baker, said, would you all be interested in a, a bigger volume of, this, uh, of the history? And so with that, we worked together and the Baker uh, uh, edition will come up this November, um, where we will push the, the history of praise and worship all the way back to the 1940s, wow. with its origin in Vancouver. Uh, so if you go to my Facebook or Lesser Facebook, um, he offered a chapter where you can read about uh, this new book that's coming out in November. I just saw that on my Facebook feed yeah. uh, within the last couple of days. So uh, I appreciate that. Now, the, the title is Loving on Jesus, right? No, the title is A, a, a History of Contemporary Praise and Worship. Oh, okay. Uh, purpose. Purpose. Yeah, I think it's, yeah. yeah. If you look at the Baker, is there, I cannot remember the long title, but it's a history. It's, it's not concise, but it's a much uh, uh, lengthy telling of the history. I see. So this is actually a new a new book. of your, your original. Yeah. And what we I would say about this new book is that it covers more ethnic communities than in the past. Because for us, most of the time, we think praise and worship is a Anglo movement, white people. Not true. In this new book that we are coming up, we will find the movements of the African American people, the Hispanic people, um, even Chinese. You will, you will see them represented. Even First Nations, Native Americans are in the book. So you will see a, a, a nice comprehensive take of this music making phenomenon in North America. That's very interesting. You know, Adam Perez, who is currently on our, our executive committee and has uh, been a student of Lester Ruth's, uh, recently said, you know, if you want to talk about real global music, you should talk about praise and worship because it is everywhere. It is throughout 25% yeah. of Christians throughout the world are, are singing praise and worship uh, right. in, their, in their worship services. Yeah, you're right. It is, it's a new movement in the 20th century and it is in our lifetime. So if, and right now I know Lesser has done amazing work at Duke to document and he has, he has surrounded himself with very good students um, that is actually carrying on the work in this particular interesting phenomenon. It's as strong as a Victorian hymnody that we talked about in history, right? So, cool. It's, I wonder if we could turn to the Hymn Society for a minute, because you've been uh, deeply involved in the last few years, especially six years as director of research. And I, I'm wondering um, how, how you, what you've seen going on in the Hymn Society during your, uh, your time in leadership and as a member. Okay, I came on board 20, am I right, 2016 or 2014 or something. 2014. Like 2014. Um, when I first came in, um, I can say that the focus of the Hymn Society was in transition. It was still very much hymn-centered, um, still very much historical hymn-centered. Euro, European hymns, maybe sometimes some American stuff that you, you see there. Um, but basically it's hymns. By, by the time I'm done, uh, when I left, when I finished my term in 2020, I could see a distinct shift. One, the, a lot of the people who are members of the hymn society were getting younger. Also, the idea of hymns have expanded to congregational song so that we are not just talking about a strophic form, but we are even talking about a congregational song that has things like pre-chorus, a bridge, the kind of approach that's much more contemporary worship kind of thing. We are even looking at retuning hymns, um, the work of Kevin Tweet uh, is down in um, RUF or Belmont. Very, very interesting work that is being done. Um, we were willing to push the envelope, I think. And, and sometimes we were even looking beyond the shores of North America. I think hymn society in my time has begun to, to get beyond the rooms of the library to the world. And I think that is very, very impressive. I think that's very important. 
um, him society saw itself as an agency for the song, but not just in North America, not just US, but the world. So I'm very impressed by the effort made to reach out, to connect, uh, particularly for the next year's event. Uh, I've seen emails that you've sent. I've seen email from other people where efforts have been made to reach out to various hymn societies or its form in other parts of the world. I think this is so important because as uh, the theme of the hymn society says is that you want to see song transforming people, transforming life. I think this is one way um, that the hymn society has successfully done its work, to reach out to other people. Um, what is also very important for me is the various projects that the hymn society has done. Songs of the Other, amazing work. Where can we find uh, uh, the, this kind of resources? Only through the hymn society or the songs in times of crisis. So very important. I mean, we need this kind of songs. They are a very targeted uh, feel um, that enable the work of the hymn society to touch and reach out um, to Party, to organizations, to churches that would have not think, uh, thought about the hymn society being able to do this. So this is amazing work. So that's a change that I've seen uh, in my few years with the hymn society. You know, just based on the conversation we've had so far, it's pretty clear that you've had an influence on that, right? Because uh, you have brought with you so many of the things we've talked about today and have been able to influence uh, some of the things that, that, that we've been doing. Well, actually, not my, it's the leadership. It's not me. I'm just a small mouthpiece. I think overall, the, the, the sentiment on the ground, the leadership, the president, very much drive the thing. The executive director very much drives the thing. Um, and my voice is basically at consent to it and to provide whatever support I can to do this because I think it is an important work uh, of the hymn society because it believes in the power of the song. I think that makes a big difference. It is not just a musical phenomenon. It is a sociological phenomenon. What can music do beyond its musical nature? And that's what the hymn society holds on to and able to to create the mission and the vision uh, of this particular world. And to me, that's kudos to everybody who's, who serve on the team. Well, if you were to identify um, what you think are like the main, what the primary challenges to the hymn society today, what, 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 would you, uh, what would you say? Primary challenges. Like, what, what? I think, it, right now, one of the songs that come to my mind is this very famous 1970 Coca-Cola jingle. I like to teach the world a song, mm -hmm. right? And I, I'm not sure some of your re readers may not know this, but if they do not, go Google that jingle and go listen to it. It speaks of a particular purpose. And I believe that is the purpose of the hymn society. How do we provide or mediate this purpose of teaching the world to sing in perfect harmony, mm. not in the four part I'm talking about, but in unity, in a re reconciled form. There's so much tension in our society nowadays in North America. We have racism issue, discrimination issues. How do we reconcile our society through song? That's a major mission, I think. And I would love to see how the hymn society flesh out a vision, a plan of enabling that to happen, to teach the world, our world, the world in North America, to sing in harmony and in unity. You know, that kind of goes back to something you were saying earlier about um, the Asian value of harmony. And uh, in some ways that perhaps is the gift of Asia to, to the whole world is in singing is to try to teach people to not only sing in harmony, but to, to live in harmony that are okay. singing matches matches our living. I think that's yes. what I hear you saying, yes? Yes, that's right. Yeah, I yeah. hope so. I mean, so I'm, I'm eager to see what Hymn Society uh, will do in the next few years. Very exciting time. The next hundred years, right? Oh, yes, that's right. <laughs> so uh, one last question, you know, so we, 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 we have our centennial coming up and I think a lot of us are going into this celebration with uh, sort of what our wishes for um, what, what can happen in the next hundred years. Uh, any, any wishes that you would like to ex uh, put out there for the Hymn Society in the next hundred years? 
I like to see uh, uh, the, the ability to hold on to our tradition but, and the courage to push the boundary. I like to see that. I think if the Him Society can do that over the next 100 years, it will be an amazing organization. Hold on to our institutional memory and challenge and, and, well, and push the boundary of development. That would yeah. be amazing. That, that's, may it be so. Yes, amen. <laughs> well, I, I really have enjoyed talking to you today. This has been really fun. And uh, uh, thank you so much for taking the time and for, for sharing your, your experiences and your thoughts to, with, with all of us today. Yep. Happy to do so, Mike. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate this. And we're going to be back in just a few weeks uh, and we'll be doing this eight more times. And uh, I, I can't wait to hear what everyone else has to say, too. We're off to a great start. So thank you, Sui Hong. Thank Take you, Mike. Okay. Yep. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody.